Chapter 2 She had never considered herself a delinquent. Until now. Prolasia fruitlessly adjusted her sparkling black tankini in the mirror. It didn't exactly squeeze all of the right places, but it would have to do. She gave herself a thorough look. Her deep maze of honey and marigold eyes glowed faintly in the dim room. Prominent black markings along her forehead signaled that she was of royal blood. Upon first glance, her scales appeared gray and tarnished. But as she meandered cautiously to the window, her tail exposed a phantasmagoria of prisms and colors. Lilac diamonds, aquamarine gems, onyx lattices. On each side of her half-moon sideburn sat starbursts of silver and peridot gills that tinged red with anticipation. She was a striking ethereal figure. She was a princess. So why didn't she feel like one? With a final sigh, Prolasia stepped away from the mirror. She glanced back at her waterbed, a plushy tank that sat high off the ground. Inflatable pillows, positioned to mimic a makeshift body, floated atop it just right. She looked around the rest of her grand bedroom, decorated with band posters and photos of a smiling, polished family. Careful to keep out of sight from anyone down below, she swam up to her bedroom window. Beneath, she could hear reporters chattering from where they had staked out in front of the castle like a flock of vultures. As Perlacia leaned over to get a peek at them, her tail knocked her glittering crown from its shelf. Her eyes grew wide as she snapped it out of the water before it could bump into anything. She swore she heard Finn swishes in the hall, sweeping fast. A moment of terror came over her. She swam in a tight circle before coming to her senses. It's now or never, she told herself. The princess turned back to her vanity and grabbed a small bottle of eye droplets. Tilting her head back, she dropped a few into her eyes. The world blurred for a moment before everything came back in intense, vivid color. It took her a moment to adjust to a new vision. But when she finally took a gander at herself in the mirror, she saw her golden eyes had been transformed into dilated jet black pupils. Oh, she was ready. Outside, reporters from the Sand Prince and other minor tabloids were camped in a big group with their cameras resting on their tails, just waiting for something newsworthy or even just mildly juicy to occur. Soon enough, they saw an obscure figure approaching slowly from one of the castle's side doors. Immediately, the reporters descended upon the mermaid, shouting rapid fire questions. They studied her carefully, but could see no royal markings beneath the elephantine rim of her oversized hat. And they knew of no regular visitors to the castles, with eyes as large and black as hers. Miss, miss, have you seen the princess? Or the crown prince? Miss, is there any news as to when the princess will finally part sand? Has the prince found a future queen yet? Have you seen the princess tonight? They bombarded the mermaid with questions, but she remained impassive. Clutching her snail fur cloak tighter around her, the mermaid pointed an elegant finger in the opposite direction. I think she swam that away. Before the words had even fully left her mouth, the reporters were racing off through the dark waters. Finally alone, Perlacia chuckled and threw off her cloak and hat. She stared back at the sleepy castle with a sense of pride. The golden wall seemed to sway and ripple in the flickering moonlight, creating the illusion of infinite movement. The castle loomed high above all of Atlantica like the watchful, overprotective eyes of her parents. But tonight, Perlacia would finally have the chance to be invisible. A quiet, teasing voice came from behind her. No crown tonight, princess. Perlacia turned to see her best schoolie, Athena, smirking from her hiding spot beneath the giant cluster of vibrant anemones. The fiery-haired Jade Hill mermaid was dressed in a shimmery emerald tankini that left little to the imagination. 
and her eyes sparkled with challenge. You know I don't believe in hierarchies, Perlacia reminded her, brushing past the taller mermaid. I hate when you try to put me on a pedestal. Without that crown, you give me no choice but to look down on you, Athena looped her arm through Perlacia's. When you rise, so do I. Says the president's daughter, Perlacia tried not to let her schoolie's words get to her. Athena had always had a bit of an ego, plus an overdose of hubris. Still, Prolasia considered her the coolest mermaid in the sea. Athena's father had been elected to presidency around the same time Prolasia's dad became king. They grew up together and were practically sisters. Over the years, Prolasia had come to trust Athena's judgment unquestioningly. Athena checked Prolasia with her hip playfully as the two mermaids began to swim stealthily away from the castle. As they neared the edge, of the castle's grounds, Perlacia spotted movement near the gates. They crept closer. The moon caught the guard's midnight blue tail in its light, and Perlacia quickly pulled Athena behind a topiary. Athena hissed. What's your problem? It's Navy, the girl who I fought yesterday. If she sees us out here, she'll run and tell my father before we even make it to the swimway. I'm not allowed to leave the castle without a guard. You know, you can barely leave the castle at all, Athena snapped. Who cares if she sees you? You're the princess. Just order her to let us pass. Perlacia shook her head sadly. Athena had always thought the princess held a lot more sway than she actually did. She would never listen to me. You think she's still mad you kicked her tail earlier? Probably, Perlacia huffed. Navy has despised me forever. Athena rolled her eyes but sat with a quiet pout as they waited for Navy to pass out of sight. As soon as they were in the clear, the two mermaids made a break for the castle gates. They passed beneath the ornate golden arches. Perlacia began to feel an incredible weight lift off her chest. Athena had exaggerated when she said Perlacia never left the castle. She had often ventured off the royal grounds for parties or political events or press opportunities, but this night was different. No parents, no guards, no one to tell her where to go or who to be. It felt like swimming out into the world for the first time all over again. Ahead, Prolasia could see that the swimway was still packed despite the late hour. Merfolk ebbed and rushed through the free-forming tunnel like underwater ghosts. During rush hour, swimway traffic would grow so dense with mermen that you couldn't see past six feet. Had never ridden the swimway unchaperoned before, she grabbed Athena's hand to slow her. Did you snag us fake permits? Athena scoffed. No, I got us concert tickets instead. Can you believe it? She held up two stamped pieces of sandpaper. Fifty sand dollars for a dusty lawn. Perlacia could believe it, though. They were sneaking out to see the Beluga Symphony, the most famous band in the sea. Now she was on the verge of committing another crime, swimming in the swimway without a permit. Without warning, Athena hopped in the school merman whipping past. Her back arched with abandon, her dorsal fins flattened and her hair fanned out in a deluge of burning orange. Prolacia scanned the water in astonishment, then envy. She wanted in. As if reading her mind, Athena rounded the moat a second time, then jutted her arm out and pulled Prolacia inside. The rush was intoxicating. Water and bubbles rushed past her ceaselessly, obscuring her vision and sense of direction. She felt the water's tides pulling her in every direction, clamping on her fins and fingers as she tried to find her balance within the narrow channel. Merfolk around her seemed to move in perfect synchronicity with each other, slicing effortlessly through the water as one unit. She steadied her breathing, finding Athena's vibrant hair ahead of her and copying her friend's form. She too arched her back, straightened her fins, trying to beat in time with the other merfolk around her. Finally, the water stopped fighting her as she leveled out and began to glide through the channel. The short window of time they were flying along the swimway seemed like all of eternity, 
and as they neared their destination, it took everything inside Prolegia to halt and peel away. They arrived at the pack venue with less than five minutes to spare. Prolegia and Athena were fortunate enough to press their way from their assigned section up to the front row. The vibe was as raw and untamed as Prolegia had imagined it would be. Swiftly, the curtain on the outdoor stage pulled back and a blanket of fog swept the audience. The infamous white whales of the Beluga Symphony sliced through the clouds, their long necks flowing to their elongated bodies. The lead Beluga whale peeled track as he skated through the gush of water, squeaking out a haunting casophony. As most merfolk relied less on visual senses, music was the heart and soul of their society and the primary form of communication. Verses of grand ballads served as repositories of the ecological knowledge that helped their species survive, even through years of rampant disease and low prey abundance. Merfolk's euphonious language held tightly on secrets that allowed them to dominate the sea. Mormalian songs extended beyond words. Music was something to experience, something to feel. Vibrations flowed through Prelasia's limbs, her chest cavity, and tingled through her spine like a rush of warmth. When the lead singer described his first love, Prelasia, although she herself had no experience in that department, could feel perfectly a mirror image of his English. Those songs were more than music. They were prayers. And this particular song, Unrequited, Melancholy, was a prayer for Prelasia on the eve of her 17th birthday. She belted out pops and squawks and whirs and clicks as best as she could. Normally, it required an average of three years for a mermaid to master an entire call or ballad. But Prelasia had been determined to learn the entire Beluga Symphony album before the concert. Each call classed for hours, and most varied every time they were expressed. A call, when done right, could travel thousands of miles through the ocean, while remaining imperceptible to the human ear. Those who master calls, especially those as complex as the Beluga symphonies, were highly respected in society. Singers were the record keepers, like swimming libraries, and it was one of the few professions that female mermaids could pursue. In addition to teaching and caretaking, of course, knowing that any loss to this artistic form would be equivalent to cultural suicide, Merfolk paid a premium for music production. Athena looked out at Prelatia with a single raised brow. You're singing like it's your last rendezvous. Prelatia cut off her song abruptly, calling back over the music around them. It might be. What are you talking about? You can do anything you want, your highness. She snorted out those last words with a haughty huff that irked Prolasia. She rolled on her friend, suddenly serious. Prolasia said, If I were to explain to you what life is really like as a royal, would you even understand? I can't go anywhere, do anything, decide anything without it being approved by my parents and guards and advisors. I'm living in a gilded cage, Athena. Athena was unimpressed. Most mermaids would kill to have your station in life, but if you want out, why don't you just break free? Prolasia couldn't come up with an answer to that. Prolasia crept towards the servant's entrance of the castle, trying to move her tail through the water as silently as possible. The small door was at the foot of the castle's south wing and opened into a hidden system of corridors that led straight to her room. It was pretty much the only way for her to get through the castle without being seen. Reaching the door, Prolasia tried to push her way inside quickly, only to find it locked. She tried a few more times, being careful not to bang the door much. Yet it wouldn't budge, it made no sense. She had left it open for herself when she escaped earlier that night. She had been certain to before retreating to her bedroom. Prolasia pushed against the door again when suddenly it swung open and she tumbled through into the lit corridor. Isis stood over her, 